Hi everyone, um, this is very, very strange, this is really weird, I am sitting in my dining room uh, doing a lecture, right? So um, yeah, bear with me, stick with this, this is going to be the 20th century's newspapers lecture, just before I actually begin going through the slides today, let me just tell you a little bit about what uh, is going to happen with this module. Um, obviously I'm going to do this lecture, I'm going to do the television lecture, Reese is going to do the computers lecture and that'll be it. That'll be the end of the module then. Um, you will get an announcement about the exam fairly soon. Uh, plans are being put in place but bear with me for the time being and I will email you when the time is right just to let you know what's going on with the exam. Um, the first assignment which obviously covers the first six weeks of the module that is not going to change that submission date will be on April the 1st but if for whatever reason you are say in quarantine or something like that or you're traveling a long distance and you're not going to be able to get it done this is what you need to do you need to email the college office so that email address is COA college office that's all one word at swansea.ac.uk send them an email and they will grant you an extension they're pretty much granting extensions now uh, if you've got any kind of adverse circumstances but i advise you to do that as soon as possible i'll put this in an email as well so uh, you don't miss out so today 20th century newspapers you can see from the first slide here freddie stein my hamster from the sun what a journal the sun is what a wonderful thing and what a time to be alive that the sun still exists uh, what I want to do today is talk you through the history of the 20th century newspapers and why they've become so critically important in the British context in particular. So, we've already done newspapers, newspapers up to the late 19th century. Uh, some of you are doing an essay on that. I've seen some essays that people are doing on it and they're looking good. That era was defined by a fight against censorship, freedom of the press and political representation. Uh, the idea that the bourgeois... Uh, middle class that developed in the Industrial Revolution in the UK set up their own press in order to represent their own political views. And indeed, you had the extension then of the radical press emerging at the same time as well to express the views of the newly formed proletariat class as well. The 20th century is a very different story. What happens in the 20th century is an era which is defined much more about commercialism, a new model for funding the press and the media in general and um, an idea of a change in journalistic ideals over that time to match the market that has been set up by newspapers. So by the late 19th century what do we have? We have large-scale industrialization of the press with new technology, capitalization of the press. Now what I mean by that is that the press has largely become now a capital intensive industry. In order to be involved in the press, as we remember from the lecture on newspapers in week two, the idea of having small scale, you know, poorly funded press disappears in the 19th century. And we go towards this um, sort of consolidation of the press in the hands of very wealthy, very rich individuals. In line with that, journalism itself starts to change and you start to get lighter human interest journalism and indeed the emergence of a journalistic profession itself, journalists as a job and a role. Journalists are still in the 19th century have this professional ideal of objectivity, impartiality, etc., holding government to account. In the 20th century, that will remain, but journalism as a profession will become more market oriented and will become perhaps less objective and much more subjective over time. Sorry about that, I had to go and get my uh, glass of cola. So I just had to hit pause for a second. So, key figure in the 20th century newspaper industry is Alfred Harmsworth publisher of the Daily Mail. Uh, the Daily Mail emerges um, on the 4th of May 1896. As we well know, the Daily Mail still exists today. Not my favourite newspaper and uh, not my favourite website either. Um, in fact, the whole thing is awful and terrible and yeah, let's not get into it right now. 
Harmsworth's influence on the newspaper industry cannot be underestimated. A hugely important figure. So his contributions really revolve around the production of and the business and economic model for the press, which dominates to this day, albeit that economic model is now in serious trouble. So the Daily Mail becomes a mass circulation daily newspaper. So for half a penny, the busy man's daily journal, marketed to all classes of individuals for a very cheap selling price. So by 1900, four years after its launch, selling 989,000 copies a day, and by 1902, goes over the million mark. And what you've got to remember is, for each copy of the newspaper sold, you have more people reading the newspaper. You know, one person will buy it, they will take it home, so maybe two or three people will read it. If it's bought for a workplace, several people are going to read it. The emergence of the Daily Mail as a mass circulation daily newspaper then leads to the emergence of the Daily Express and the Daily Mirror in, April, in 1900 and 1903 respectively. <coughs> the Express lags behind the Mail for a long time but it uh, takes off after 1916 and became known for its crusading journalism and political opinions, which is a real irony in this day and age because the Daily Express today is an absolute joke of a newspaper that is obsessed with still Princess Diana and uh, immigrants and how bad the weather is and that's basically the three headlines that they always have. The Daily Mirror was originally launched for women uh, and was an illustrated publication, a fully illustrated publication, the first fully il illustrated newspaper. Um, the Mirror changes a lot over time but I'll come back to uh, the importance of the Mirror when we hit like the 1960s. So the mirror, successful emphasis on photography, this idea, so we've got a crossover in the module here. So the emergence of photography, as we know, photography becomes an extremely important medium in the um, late part of the 19th century. And the Daily Mirror capitalizes on this. And you can see on the slide there that um, front cover of a presidential election in the United States, fully illustrated, all images, very clear, clear visual design and layout, easy to absorb any information from the Daily Mirror. The start of what we call tabloid press. The idea that, you know, there's very, very um, clear messages given out in a very simplistic style by a particular newspaper and very populist. So the Mail, Mirror and uh, Express, they dominate the market up to the start of World War I, which is in 1914. And by 1918, the end of World War I, and we can see a Daily Mirror copy here of um, November the 12th and 1918, so the day after the Armistice Day, total circulation of newspapers, 3.1 million a day. So it's a huge number of uh, newspapers being sold per day. So we look at the numbers in the 19th century, and even when Harmsworth starts, with the Daily Mail in 1896. By 1918, so we're talking 22 years later, we've gone from very small circulation numbers to 3.1 million a day. Huge revenue and, of course, huge reach in terms of audience. And it goes hand in hand with technological improvements as well. So the press becomes more automated, quicker to use, um, more efficient, so you can produce more copies cheaper. So you get faster drying ink, rail and van distribution improves, so the whole entire distribution of the newspaper network becomes better and therefore sales improve at the same time. Again, like I was saying with regards to the um, cinema last week, um, war is incredibly important for the newspapers. So in Britain, it's no surprise that in the period where you see the launch of the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, the Boer War of 1899 to 1902, that becomes a huge seller with regards to newspapers. And indeed, the First World War will become a massive seller, although there's major censorship of what happens in the war during that time as well. So the coverage of the Boer War in 1902 is characterised to a lot of graphics, a lot of imagery, a lot of photography, a lot of comment pieces, a lot of patriotic coverage, virtually propaganda style coverage, which these newspapers embrace and recognise is very, very important for sales. So the mass circulation dailies, that's a Harmsworth thing. Secondly, the major innovation of Alfred Harmsworth cater into popular tastes. So the Daily Mail used popular human interest content and short, digestible and interesting news items. Weirdly, that formula has not changed for that newspaper over time. 
albeit it's <sighs> the type of news that it covers now the daily mail is different but it still has this kind of mix basically a very much a tabloid style of journalism emphasizing human interest and sensation aimed at the lower middle classes and a family audience lower middle class working class the sort of upper middle classes and the upper classes are catered to by different newspapers like the times for example but the daily mail looks for the mass market so very bright very entertaining coverage limited political coverage very partisan political coverage but very limited in style so very much about diversion rather than anything else so harmsworth what happened to him well he became ennobled he became a lord he became lord northcliffe in 1904 and really became the first british press baron owning a lot of newspapers so from the daily mail he picks up the daily mirror the sunday dispatch the evening news bought the observer and the times for example as well to try to actually capitalize and consolidate the entire newspaper industry you might ask okay Leighton, why did he do that well because there's money in those newspapers a huge amount of money in fact so harmsworth and what i was saying earlier about capitalization of the industry harmsworth is very aware of the notion of capitalization harmsworth's entire business model is built on successively trying to accumulate more newspapers over time to consolidate the market but in order to do that he needs to maximize the profits of all the newspapers that he has in the first place so it's almost like nobody else can get into the game because this guy's stable of newspapers is so large he can basically pick up anything so the northcliffe revolution as we call it um which is really his major major we we kind of group his influence under um is the responsibility you know he's responsible for changing the entire newspaper industry economics basically his behavior in consolidating the industry into his ownership basically made newspapers and along with the changes in industrialization and the changes in production meant that newspapers were now too expensive for anyone but the very wealthy to own they basically became too expensive to produce because the technology involved the amount of people that you needed and i'm not just talking journalists here i'm talking people who work in production so printers people who work in distribution there's a, you know, a huge industry here and in order to even get a foothold in that industry you need to be incredibly uh, in industry you need to be incredibly wealthy um so much so though and so complex and so expensive does this become that you can no longer rely on actual newspaper sales to fund the industry itself north if north clifford relied just on his you know pennies for the daily mail he would have gone bankrupt so the Northcliffe revolution involves a complete transferal and complete uh, revolution in the way that the industry is funded. So his solution to the cost element of this was to sell actually below the cost of the newspaper. Sell as much as you can and use inhuman interest stories to build up circulation and then sell the readership to advertisers so what northcliffe did in his revolution which is incredibly important is change the dynamic of who the customer for the newspaper actually is at one at one level you have the readers who are the customers and we can still accept that you know the readership is a, you know these people are customers of the newspaper they're paying for the newspaper but he's got a secondary set of customers for his business at this point as well the advertisers so you have on each newspaper you have visible audited circulation figures and basically he used to sell advertising in his newspapers on cost based on per 1000 readers so if you're selling a million copies a day per 1000 readers you, you know if you're an advertiser i gotta get my product out there i'm selling something i want to get it out into as many hands as possible i need to advertise effectively Ooh, here's the daily mail wow here's a circulation of over a million copies per day this is where i'm going to put my product fantastic this doesn't just involve a change in business model but it involves a change in the layout of the newspaper itself so you actually see the newspaper layout change completely and it's interesting if you pick up a newspaper even if you pick up something like the metro right a free newspaper 
turn to page seven. I guarantee you page seven is full of advertising. This is a sort of set of rules for the layout of newspapers, which has been in place since Northcliffe, Northcliffe's times. And it continues to be the dominant mode of newspaper production to this day as well. The Sun loses lots of money, but its primary business is not actually the readership. It is advertising itself. The reason why it loses money is because advertising revenue is dropping. Again, I'll come to that towards the end of this lecture. So basically Northcliffe's revolution involved shifting the industry to reliance on advertising. No longer producing a newspaper, but producing a mass audience. Producing an audience of massive readers to be sold to advertisers. And basically, advertisers from this point in time become incredibly important within the newspaper industry, influencing the type of content that newspapers produce. So we like newspapers lose a sense of objectivity with this new uh, method. So tabloid style human interest papers delivering mass lower income readership, that becomes the model. That's what you want as a newspaper owner. You want to hit that sweet spot so you can sell as much advertising as possible. You still have a broadsheets press you know, delivering very small but an economically important readership and they have because of that, a very unique position in advertising as well. And you tend to get more high class, more high end products being advertised in those newspapers. Anything in between those two points though, becomes increasingly squeezed over time throughout the 20th century. And this is kind of the point where we're at today, where you have a very small and very small in circulation broadsheet market in the UK. We have the Guardian, you have the Times, you have the Telegraph. And then you have a mass of lower market newspapers and the mid market. I mean, I guess the Daily Mail and the Daily Express would say they're mid market newspapers. That's not really true. Um, they're much more lower class than that. But it, we have a polarization, basically, the industry between these two different poles between go for as many readers as possible and go as high class as possible. The concentration of ownership between 18, uh, 1918 and 1939 is incredibly important in the development of the press. So you, during this post-World War I period up to World War II, huge soaring of sales over that time, but a very much a loss of diversity as newspapers become consolidated in the hands of very, very few rich, wealthy men. So a lot of success for a small number of titles owned by these kind of wealthy family groups. By 1914, Northcliffe owned 40% of the national morning newspapers, 45% of the evening press and 15% of the Sunday press. And when he died in 1922 and, and um, took over, the business was taken over by his brother, Harold Harmsworth, that had even intensified further. They owned more newspapers, they consolidated further. So this concentration of ownership is actually a very dangerous thing because you have newspapers concentrated in the hands of a very limited number of people who can still use their newspapers to further their own ends in terms of politics. And that becomes apparent as we move forward. So that business, the, this when Beaverbrook takes over from his brother Harms, when, so when Harold Harms with Lord Beaverbrook, uh, sorry, let me go back a second. Um, so when the business is consolidated further, thank you. Thanks for bearing with me over that little bit. I just lost my words for a second. Controlling 100 weeklies and monthlies and four dailies, the Evening Mail, Daily Mail, Daily Mirror and the Times. Rothmere then sold the Times to the Astor family and Max Aiken, uh, Lord Beaverbrook, who owned the Express and the Evening Standard, but would um, also start to take over things. So the press balance do start to sort of trade newspapers between one another in this period. Think of newspapers at this time as like wealthy men's playthings, you know, um, and these uh, papers trade hands over and over, um, obviously for huge sums of money um, in order to gain different levels of political influence. We see that, uh, you know, Churchill with Beaverbrook, for example. Basically, in the age of the press baron, what you have is very wealthy, ennobled, so we're talking about lords uh, owning newspaper groups. Um, these people, you might have, well, why are they lords? What, what, what happened there? Well, in order, obviously, to be on the right side of the press, politicians would give knighthoods 
and lordships to the people who own newspapers to keep them on side. So these people gain huge political importance during this period, thanks to the consolidation of the press in those hands. The press barons are very much interventionist and controlling owners, very much in the business of overruling editors, imposing their own views and character on the papers, whilst making this fallacious claim to be speaking for the people. Again, this is a feature of press ownership today as well. You, you get like um, the Sun, for example, is you know, the voice of working class Britain. The Sun is owned by Rupert Murdoch, an Australian American billionaire. He is not working class, he's never been working class, but his newspaper somehow is the voice of working class Britain. This is not a new thing, this was going on you know, in the middle part of the last century. These uh, press owners usually have aspirations of political influence and even during this time were very much criticised for the influence that they would have on the public, the influence that they would use their newspapers to express their political views as being the views of the public and try to convince people of the sort of correctness of their views. In terms of political influence, there's a number of examples of how influential these newspapers were. So during the First World War, Norcliffe uh, Times newspaper reports a shell crisis. And what I mean by reports with tenacity keeps on reporting about this shell crisis, keeps on reporting that Britain is actually not producing enough in terms of armaments and munitions for the war. That campaign brings down Asquith's wartime government, Asquith the Prime Minister at the start of the world, First World War. Now when Lloyd George became, David Lloyd George, the last Welsh Prime Minister, became Prime Minister in 1916, he made Northcliffe as director of propaganda for his government and Beaverbrook became a minister. So he basically enrolled the press barons into the wartime government to keep them on side and to have some kind of influence over what the press was doing. But at the same time, of course, now you have people who own newspapers sitting in government at a time of global war. So it's an incredible scenario, basically, that the newspaper owners were able to use their newspapers to take down government and basically buy a seat at the top table and influence wartime policy making. You know, it, um, it kind of staggering, really, uh, how democracy was subverted by the newspapers during the First World War. Another great example, probably the classic example of the early part of the 20th century of political influence. is the Zinoviev letter. This um, comes around after the collapse of the first Labour government led by uh, uh, Keir Hardy. No, was it Keir Hardy? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, that's why our building is named the way it is, right? So um, after the collapse of the first Labour government in uh, October 1924, with an election in 1924, uh, to elect a new government. So the Labour government can no longer govern, basically it uh, doesn't have the numbers in Parliament anymore to pass any policies, so call a general election. Um, and the Zinoviev letter was published four days before that general election, a claim that this letter was from a Soviet politician and promoting revolution in England uh, through, this, uh, through this Soviet politician writing to try and start a civil war in Britain to start a communist revolution. So you have the Daily Mail publishing a, what is apparently a letter from Moscow to the Labour Party, ordering the Labour Party to start a revolution on the basis, you know, on the same kind of lines as the Soviet revolution in Russia in 1917. Um, I'm saying, well, that's kind of important. That's huge, right? That's massive. You know, the Soviet Union commanding the Labour Party in Britain to start a communist revolution. Wow, this is massive stuff. So the letter was purported to be from uh, Grigory Zin um, Zinoviev, uh, president of the Comintern, in the internal communist organisation. Uh, and called on British communists to mobilise sympathetic forces in the Labour Party to support an Anglo-Soviet treaty and to encourage agitation pro propaganda in the armed forces. Um, basically, 
to start the beginning of a civil war in England, uh, which would lead to a revolution, which would lead to a, the formation of a communist state. Uh, hugely embarrassing to the Labour Party, obviously, the publication of this letter. The Conservatives won the election with Stanley Baldwin becoming the new um, Prime Minister. And unsurprisingly, the letter was a forgery. There, no such letter, no such communication existed. This was a letter forged by anti-communist Russians who were also anti-Labour Party in the, U in, uh, the UK. The letter was uh, leaked to the Conservative Party and then the Conservative Party made sure it was leaked and published in the Daily Mail. So, I mean, we know and we use the term so regularly that we live in a time of fake news. Here's your classic example of fake news. A forged letter leaked by the security services to politicians who then make sure it goes in a newspaper four days before a general election. So it goes in the biggest newspaper in the country four days before a general election and surprise, surprise, the general election is won by the Conservative Party. Kind of bonkers, guys. So, we are in a time when newspapers have a vast amount of political influence and can even shape policy at wartime and can shape the results of elections in the country. Kind of crazy. So newspapers in the 1930s, what happens in this period? Obviously the 1930s is characterized by sort of the march to war and World War II. So you have a time of increasing international tensions. But the newspaper industry actually goes towards a different kind of route and tries to provide a very much an escapist route away from the reality of our times. So newspapers in general downplayed the threat of war, peddled a sort of naive optimism due to the circulation wars that they all found themselves in in this period as well. The, the happier the content, the lighter the content, the more the newspaper sold. So very few newspapers were actually reporting on what was going on in Europe and how you know, the inevitable march towards World War II was happening. So here's a quote from um, Kevin Williams. Um, the mass of people sought reassurance in an age of fear, doubt and uncertainty. Newspapers remained upbeat to provide escapism for a country weighed down by difficulty. The British press in the 1930s sought to avoid challenging matters and provide images of the nation as stable, harmonious and happy. Basically, the British press in the 1930s is gaslighting the country. It's reporting that, um, you know, these, uh, you know, everything is fine. Do, 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 do. Everything is happy. Everything is great. Uh, at a time of incredible international tension. Um, so it's a kind of a unique approach, really. Um, in, in Kevin's own analysis of this, uh, so British newspapers of nearly all shades of opinion failed in their efforts to fully, frankly and fairly report the events of the interwar years. In particular, the conditions of poverty and unemployment, the rise of fascism and the crisis in British institutions such as the abdication of, eight, of 1936. So even like critically important events to the constitution of the country, like the abdication of Edward VIII in uh, 1936, these almost get glossed over in the popular press. You know, there's not critical reporting of these, um, of what, what happened during this time. And in particular, sort of the poverty and um, the, I mean, we talked about this with regards to the radio, right? And uh, looking at uh, John Reith and um, how the BBC sort of glossed over um, the events of the general strike of 1926. As the Great Depression strikes in the early part of the 1930s, newspapers turn a blind eye to the struggles of the poor, uh, to the mass poverty that engulfs the country and indeed engulfs the world as, we, uh, as the world goes through the Great Depression of 1929 through to about 1933. And in doing so, what Williams is arguing is that the, the, basically by, through this gaslighting of the British population, it leaves the population unprepared for what's coming at the end of the 30s. Uh, the population is relatively naive when it comes to understanding what is going to happen, and that is a disservice to the entire population itself. So, 
concentrating on the abdication crisis of 1936. The um, if we think about what the press did with the monarchy during that time, and it's not too dissimilar to what it is today, although the Meghan Markle um, debacle of the last few months actually does show some kind of changes in how the press react towards royalty. Basically, the press in the 1930s has an adulation, a fawning attitude towards the royal family. This is part of the deliberate attempts to try and you know, avoid real problems in the world. So lots of royal news, lots of royal coverage, lots of deferential coverage of the royals. And this led to deferential coverage of the abdication crisis. Um, so when there's the abdication, there's no critical reflection on Edward VIII, there's no critical reflection on the monarchy as an institution, there's no critical reflection on the um, constitutional crisis that happens in 1936, it is much more touchy-feely, oh, aren't the royals wonderful? So, well, you have things to talk about here, why aren't you talking about them? Hugely supportive of Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement um, towards Nazi Germany from 1930, uh, 1937 to 1940. Basically, very, very mute in criticism of Nazi Germany during that time, and I'll come to what that means in a second very poor coverage of economic hardship in the 1930s. If, for example, the 1932 the National Hunger March um, was widely reported as an attempt to destabilise Britain rather than an attempt for people to actually represent themselves and look for fairer conditions in the country. The press barons themselves and their relationship with politics during the 1930s is massively problematic. So many press barons were active Nazi sympathisers and supporters of fascism within Britain as well. Rothmere uh, in the Daily Mail published a huge amount of pro-Nazi material, even went so far as to meet Hitler himself, and we've got the photo there, um, and congratulate him on the annexation of Czechoslovakia as well. Um, so, you have ennobled press barons on the side of fascists in the 1930s. This, my friends, is massively, massively problematic. And next time you ever see in anything in the Daily Mail of like, you know, criticisms of anything, you just think back to when in the 1930s, the Daily Mail was all about the Nazis. And, you know, just have a think about what kind of newspaper it actually is. Fortunately, at this time, despite having massive political power in, in, in during the First World War and during the 1920s. By the 1930s, they were starting, the press barons were starting to get excluded from politics and thank God that was the case. Basically, their very radical right-wing politics, even fascist politics, was not particularly appealing to the British public in the 1930s and any political ambitions failed at that time as well. It was like, from being part of the political establishment 10 to 15 years previously, the press barons were increasingly excluded. Excuse me, from the political establishment itself. So, even though those political views were excluded at this time, um, government still engaged very heavily with the press, but in a sort of, in an attempt to create a propaganda system in order to publicise, you know, what the government was doing well and in order to kind of lead public discussion and discourse on politics through the press. You'll be familiar with this in the context of PR. And what we really see in the 1930s is an emergence of public relations on the part of government using skilled professionals, often from the journalistic profession, to engage with the press in order to get the pub in the message that the government wanted out there. So very sophisticated propaganda, news management, help government convey a message of optimism. A completely false message of optimism in the 1930s, but nevertheless a message of optimism. So we see the emergence really of public relations and press officers in this time. So then World War II strikes. So the outbreak of World War II ended basically the competition in the press at that time. Papers actually became smaller due to paper rationing. Um, 
The demand for news actually increased, of course, during this time. But radio had a much better war, as I've already discussed with um, radio. Uh, you know, I kind of alluded towards that um, last week. Cinema also starts to um, show a lot of uh, war coverage at this time as well. Um, and indeed, censorship during the war means that the freedom of the press is absolutely curtailed during this time. So this combination of factors means that newspapers actually take a bit of a, ma well, take a massive hit during World War Two. Basically, the lack of paper means advertising revenue is going to go down, means sales are going to go down. There is demand, but competing mediums like the radio and cinema mean that they can actually muscle in on the press's you know, dominance of news coverage at this time as well. And plus censorship means that they've got actually probably less real news to give out as well. The situation continued in post-war period until 1955 when paper rationing finally ended in the UK. So, I mean, the war years and the period after the war were a really, really difficult period for the newspaper industry itself. You have limited production, limited advertising revenue, limited readership and limited news. So from the glory years pre-World War II, up to 1950, you know, a huge shock hits the uh, industry. Further consolidation, fewer profits, less political influence. It's a big change. Even in 1955, when the newspapers start to re-emerge after the war, television starts to take off. So in 1953, and I'll come obviously to television uh, in the next lecture that I record, but um, television takes off in 1953. As a new competitor for entertainment and human interest stories, uh, ITV launches in 1955. Basically, that advertising model that the press so relied on pre-World War II takes a massive hit from the emergence of commercial television and television in general in 1953 as a, com as a competitor to the newspaper in terms of the attention of an audience. So during this period, the, coming out from the economic shock of World War II, you've got a new hugely popular medium emerging in the television and we see massive closures of the press so the daily so the news chronicle the daily herald the daily sketch they go under lots of sunday newspapers lots of provincial newspapers start losing titles it's carnage huge loss of advertising revenue thanks to television huge loss of readership thanks to television because television is a medium which speaks to people in a different way and newspapers start to collapse left, right and centre. Um, as Kevin says here in this quote, it's basically a numbers game which television hits in a very, very big way and the viability of newspapers is affected accordingly. So you either go for a very high-end audience or a mass low-end audience. Anything in between will just won't work but in order to get that, you're only going to have a couple of newspapers that actually get that high-end audience. You're only going to get a couple of newspapers that get enough people at the low end in order to be financially viable. So you see a collapse of the industry and a massive contraction of the industry towards a few titles. We call this polarisation. It's a period of prolonged decline for the newspaper industry. Larger papers survive, but Sundays, provincial presses, weekly presses all suffer with a huge consolidation and polarisation of the industry itself. And also, thanks perhaps to some of the incidents in the 1920s and before in, with regards to um, the validity of news coverage and political influence, you start to see the emergement of regulation. Now, it's hardly surprising that the next time the Labour government actually gets into power in the UK, just after the Second World War, so Clement Attlee's government of 1945 onwards, given the events of the 1920s with the Zinoviev letter, the Labour government of, 19, uh, of the mid part of the 1940s presses for regulation of the press. The Labour Party is sick to death of the press basically making up lies about them. So they set up a Royal Commission in 1947 to assess the role of the press in the country because Labour's always been affected by uh, press hostility and believed the press was biased against it and monopolised by Tory supporting owners. Again, does anything change? This is the circumstance that we find ourselves in today. 
Um, now, the report that was actually uh, given by that commission was very muted in its criticism and largely advocated self-regulation for the press, leading to the formation of the first press council in 1953, which a body for regulation of the press to ensure sort of appropriate political coverage, but really with very little in the way of powers, no means to enforce any of the decisions. Basically, the press pretty much ignored the, <laughs> anything that this body said. So um, the first attempt at regulation of the press and to try and bring the press under control can fail big time. But we do see to see radical changes in the 1950s with regards to ownership too. So the age of the interventionist and politically active press baron comes to an end at this period of time. It'll come back. It will return. But in the 1950s, you get a new set of proprietors like um, Lord Thompson, Roy Thompson, who owned the Times and Sunday Times, non-interventionist, ran the whole thing as a business. Um, less politically inclined and less inclined to use newspapers to express their political opinions, albeit these newspapers would still largely be conservative and right wing. In the 50s as well, the pressure on the press that came from the emergence and the um, mass membership of trade unions was incredibly important. So the rise in trade union power in the 50s and 60s at a time of economic boom and full employment at that time, post-World War II, put unique pressures on the press. Um, basically, working in the newspaper industry became a unionized profession. If you weren't part of the union, this became a closed shop. You wouldn't get jobs in the newspaper industry. That goes for journalism, that goes for printing, that goes for distribution. And the power of the unions and power of consolidated and unified labor in the industry meant high staffing levels, very high pay for people working in it, and that put incredible economic pressures on newspapers as well. And partially the reason why newspapers collapse in the 1960s is because the amount of, you know, the costs of labour in the newspaper industry also became too much to bear. Um, those unions as well were incredibly resistant to any kinds of new technology that might make the production of newspapers more efficient. And into the 1960s, we, what we're talking about here really is the emergence of digital media and uh, computers. You see, you start to see the first, and Reese will uh, do this lecture with you in a short while, but you start to see the emergence of computer technology in the 1960s, and computation will eventually transform the newspaper industry beyond recognition. There was huge resistance to the emergence of any kind of computation in the newspaper industry um, in the 1960s and the 1970s, and the unions and their power at that time meant that they could effectively block out any kind of revolutionary change in the production methods that newspapers had in that time. So, how does the industry react to all these problems? So, the modern tabloid, that emerges in the 1970s, change in size, values, content and production methods. The key moment in this was the Australian businessman Rupert Murdoch buying The Sun. Now, the Sun, according to Kevin Williams, dominate the market for the next 20 years after uh, Murdoch purchases it. Achieve this by pushing the newspaper's contest relentlessly down market and by a combination of brilliant marketing and innovative layout. It was assisted by several other factors too. Changes in the ownership of his major competitors, which made them less responsive. The economic problems of the 70s, which had a profound effect on society and the newspaper business. And the capacity of the Sun to tune into changes in British society. The bar that brought Margaret Thatcher to power in 1979 was also very very, very significant. <clears throat> what did the Sun force others to do? Force the Daily Mirror to compete. Daily Mail went tabloid in 1971, so did the Express in 77. The Daily Star launched as an illustrated rip-off of the Sun in 1978, so leaving their five national tabloids in a new circulation war. Um, the Sun and its success forced other newspapers to transform. It forced newspapers to copy its style its size and its kind of content as well. So what, you know, let's get some more detail on the Sun. So um, the Sun was launched in 1964 to replace the Daily Herald, which closed in 1964. It was very, very unsuccessful until Rupert Murdoch bought it and was re launched as a tabloid in 1969 under Larry Lamb. 
excuse me, very much a, a first at this time, following on from the sort of cultural revolution in the United Kingdom in the 1960s, we see the emergence of an affluent, younger generation of people. This newspaper was targeted directly at that generation, very much looking at young people and the interest that young people would have. So you get a newspaper focused on aspiration, leisure, consumption, show business, sport, etc. Those are the primary focuses of the newspaper, whereas other newspapers are not tapping into that demographic and that market in the same way. And what did the Sun do to sell um, as much as possible? Of course, sex. As much sex as it could possibly put in the newspaper. So on uh, November the 17th, uh, 1970, the first page three girl and the first page three spread was in the sun. That became a staple of the newspaper for many, many years afterwards. But also just the tone and the style of content in the sun is very sex oriented as well. So at that time, the mirror uh, competitor to the sun, very, very old fashioned, unable to follow the youth culture and unwilling to follow down market. Those things put the newspaper in big, big trouble. So Mirror Group newspapers uh, get reorganized in the 1970s, but the Mirror Group won't slide down market until um, Robert Maxwell would buy the newspapers in 1984. Basically, you have a competition in the tabloid industry between the relentless, cheery optimism, right-wing politics and sex, sex, sex of the sun against more traditional newspapers. And the sun wipes the floor with them. You know, the sun becomes the newspaper of choice during the 70s and 80s. On the other end of the market, after this polarization between down market newspapers and up market newspapers, at that quality press end, the broadship market re really does hold up as a valuable readership until the 1980s. Again, Murdoch sees this and intervenes. He buys the Times and the Sunday Times in 1981. He still owns those newspapers. Um, but these newspapers are targeting, you know, they're not going for the same kind of circulation. They're targeting a different kind of readership and their advertising profile is different accordingly. So in the context of the times that all of this is occurring in, it's important to understand what is going on in terms of society. Post First World, uh, post Second World War, Britain struggles and then hits an economic boom, along with most of the rest of the world. Uh, once sort of reconstruction of um, the devastation of the war in Europe is underway or partially complete, you see a huge economic boom. You see virtually full employment. There's more money. There's more disposable income for people. People have come out of the age of rationing and into the age of affluence. Um, and that brings you know a sort of different kind of society with it as well people want to spend money people want to enjoy themselves so newspapers like the sun emerging taps into that kind of um affluent optimism in the country that doesn't last <laughs> these things never do last so by 1973 um the world is back into economic depression, effectively. Um, it's really interesting that um, people, you know, during the uh, Brexit debacle in this country over the last four years, I guess, I'm just saying, oh, things, you know, we survived fine without the European Union. It's like, no, we didn't. Actually, in the early 70s, Britain was a basket case of a country. You had mass strikes, you had mass inflation, you had the three day week, a remarkable time where literally people would only go to work for three days, not because, you know, we had more leisure time or anything like that, but that's basically how long you could keep the electric on in the country for people to go to work. Um, so an extraordinary time, not really so much marked by civil disobedience and the threat of civil action, but after the optimism of the post-World War II era, a huge crash. So the gold standard ends in 1971, the Yom Kippur War and the OPEC oil embargo of 1973 drives 
cost of fuel up and the cost of petrol up, which means there's a global depression and fuel crisis, huge inflation, mass job losses, which are fought back by unions, so there's huge strikes, and a huge fracture appears in British society between, if you like, the sort of social democratic left, which had been in dominant mode, and even to an extent the conservative um, governments of the post-Second World War era, to an extent acknowledge the sort of social democratic foundations of society that had emerged during that time, and a new kind of right-wing conservatism which emerges as a response to this economic crisis. That's, in the British context, is known as Thatcherism. Margaret Thatcher, three times Prime Minister, 1979, 1983 and 1987. 79 and 83 by absolute landslides. A bit closer in 1987, she'd eventually leave office in 1990. <coughs> so she was Prime Minister for just under 11 years. Basically, Thatcher's political ideology can be summed up in two policies, economic liberalism and political conservatism. Basically, free economy and strong state. Um, so Thatcherism emerges as a response to the crises of the 1970s, but the emergence of Thatcherism taps into a very particular kind of newspaper coverage. And it's sort of the marriage of tabloid newspapers, especially the Sun, and Thatcherism becomes a marriage made in heaven for the perpetuation of the Thatcherite political and economic dogma, which would uh, dominate Britain in the 1980s. So what do we mean? What do I mean by um, uh, economic liberalism? So Thatcher's economic policies were influenced by the Austrian schools of von Mises and um, Friedrich Hayek, known as the New Right, or what we call neoliberal economics. I'm sure many of you have heard that term neoliberal before. An ideological belief in the free market against state intervention and against distortion of free markets by the state. So ideologically, the uh, economic liberals believe that companies should be allowed to get on with things and not be burdened by the state in any way, shape or form. The, the only way for things to run efficiently and best as they can is if you leave business alone. Let them get on with things. Don't burden them with regulation. Don't burden them with undue taxation, etc, etc. Businesses will, and the free market itself is self-correcting and things will be fine if you leave things alone. So, on the flip side of that, consider, like, okay, so what does the state do economically? Economic liberals are massively against the welfare state, the NHS, BBC, trade unions, any kind of workplace reg legislation. No, don't any of this. Can't have the NHS because this could be a free market in healthcare. We should get rid of the NHS. Can't have the BBC. How can you have a state-owned? How can you have a state-sponsored um, broadcaster? No, no, no. This is ridiculous. BBC is a dinosaur. We must have commercial news. You know, news. And you know, we must have commercial television. You must have all this kind of radical uh, difference to what emerged in the 50s and 60s in terms of the political consensus. Very much pro-privatisation and private ownership. So during the 1980s, you see the mass privatisation of state-owned businesses in the UK. British Telecom, for example, was a state-owned business. Now it's a private business. British Steel, the railways, that happened in the 90s, but it's the same economic dogma. Uh, British Airways was a state-owned business and now is a private business. The final sort of tenet of... Um, economic liberalism is trickle down economics. So basically the market is very, very efficient. And if you allow people who are successful in the market to become as rich as possible, that wealth will trickle down society. You know, the wealthy people will buy things. So this layer of people get stuff and then these people will buy things and basically money will flow through society. This, my friends, is absolute, complete and utter nonsense. This trickle-down economics, unbelievably, is still spouted by some followers of neoliberal um, economics today. Um, there is no evidence since the 1970s that trickle-down economics has ever worked, um, but it is still something that we hear if you follow these sort of discussions in the press and if you follow these discussions in economics, still something that people give. Uh, even to the extent to which Donald Trump has 
although he's not, I don't think he's ever used the term trickle down economics because I'm not sure you would understand what it means because he's a bit of an idiot, right? But his economic policies in the United States are a form of neoliberal trickle down economics, basically. So it's still being used, um, this, but it, it's a pillar which has just basically been blown away over time. The political conservatism that goes hand in hand with economic liberalism is very, very interesting. A conservative belief in the need for social order, so it required a strong interventionist state. And what we mean by that is the police and army. And you might think, well, Britain's not a police state. Britain's not like a military dictatorship. Well, at times in the 1980s, you would struggle to defend that view. Um, very much goes hand in hand this with a belief in personal morality and uh, an anti-liberal approach towards uh, personal morality itself as well. So, Thatcherism and the right-wing press at a time of mass austerity in the early 80s, you know, three million unemployed in Britain, etc. Uh, these two go hand in hand with one another. The press starts to reflect a lot of the both spoken and unspoken assumptions of economic liberalism and political conservatism. The press is highly anti-union, highly anti-Labour Party, anti-scroungers and immigrants, pro-business, worries about, you know, are we great anymore? Is great, you know, when, when will Britain be great again and all this nonsense? Again, if you've got any interest in newspapers, you'll recognise that these discourses are going on and have been for the last four years. Very populist politics and right-wing morality. So the right-wing press mimics the political position of the Thatcher government. You see the emergence of new owners such as Murdoch, Maxwell, Conrad Black. Primary motive financial and newspapers are actually at this point part of conglomer uh, conglomerates rather than... Um, locally used. So someone like Rupert Murdoch, for example, yes, he's a newspaper owner. He's also a television station owner. He's also a film studio owner, etc, etc, etc. Newspapers become part of a broader, wider um, business. Basically, these people are global barons. They have global influence, um, but they still like to align um, with political leaders and indeed Thatcher does a huge amount in the 1980s to promote this kind of business ethic of um, being a global press baron, pushing through takeovers, pushing, you know, supporting the business model of accumulating as much of the press and as much of other subsidiary media businesses as possible during this time. So this creates a new close relationship between the government and newspapers. Prime ministers actually go out of their way to be on side with these press barons, the new generation of press barons. I mean, um, probably the most significant thing Tony Blair did in the 1990s, before he was elected in 1997, was to meet Rupert Murdoch. And it caused a huge amount of controversy at the time. This would have been around like 1995, um, when Blair went out of his way to court Murdoch you know, and to get Murdoch on side for the Labour Party. Murdoch had never supported the Labour Party prior to that, never, you know, had a newspaper which was favourable towards the Labour Party. Blair consistently worked on that relationship until in 1997, the Sun actually came out and said, vote Labour. And people did vote Labour. Labour won by a landslide in 1997. And indeed, such was the work that Blair did in the 1990s that, um, the Labour Party was still, by and large, supported by the Sun in 2001 as well, when it won another landslide. By 2005, things had soured a little bit and, um, you know, the Sun wasn't so much on side at that point anymore, but it wasn't explicitly anti-Tony Blair. As soon as Tony Blair finishes, it goes back to hating Labour as well. But basically, in the 1980s, you see the emergence of a new kind of relationship between politics and press. Politicians recognise that they need the patronage of the press barons again. So we've almost like, in a, in a sense, gone all the way back to the 1910s and 1920s. Um, things 
just turn back around again. But it's a very different press to what existed in the 1910s and 1920s, and that's very, very important. These owners are much larger, much more media diverse in terms of their ownership of things. They don't just own newspapers, they own television stations, they own film studios, etc., etc. In the 90s, they start to own you know, companies involved with the internet, for example. So um, it's almost as if the, pra the, the, the relationship, these people are so powerful and so international that now, as opposed to in the, the, the political influence of the press barons in the 1910s and 1920s, was much more about newspapers pressuring politicians into inviting the press barons into this inner circle. Now, politicians have to chase after the press barons. They have to go for them explicitly. So, what kind of politics were there in the 1980s press? Aggressively right-wing po uh, politics, aggressively populist, playing on fears of crime, immigration, undeserving poor and scrounge, as I already said, very anti-trade union, very anti-Labour Party. Strong position on strikes. So this newspaper cover I've got here with, um, this is Arthur Scargill, the leader of the National Union of Mine Workers in 1984. Uh, in 1984 and 85, you have the uh, miners' strike, which becomes a critical sort of uh, incident in the social history of Britain in the 1980s. This front page didn't get printed. Now, as you can see, I mean, it's fairly disgusting. Mine Fuhrer, basically, they're making, because the Sun is um, arguing that Arthur Scargill is a Nazi, effectively. Um, the print unions refused to print that edition. So there was some power left in the print unions, I guess, at this time, but it gives you an illustration of just how anti-organised Labour, anti-trade union and anti-Labour Party, because the, the relationship between the Labour Party and the, the National Union of Mine Works is very close. Um, interesting other part of this front page as well, I don't know if you can see on uh, just next to the main story, you've got Sam Fox here, so basically you've got like, yeah, uh, what, what is our front page going to be today, editor? Well, uh, we're going to have uh, Arthur Scargill is a Nazi and a page three girl. Sex and politics, that's how it works, yeah? This is, actually, this is one of the, uh, this is what actually went out on that day. So, as you can see, there was some power at least, but this is an illustration of how politically aligned the Sun was as a newspaper in the 1980s. This continues into the 1990s. So this was a um, newspaper on the morning of the 1992 general election. Uh, this is Neil Kinnock, the then leader of the Labour Party. If Kinnock wins today, will the last person to leave Britain please turn out the lights? After that, I mean, it's a hugely important newspaper in context of that uh, election. Labour were favoured to win the 1992 election. It was going to be very close. But Labour led in all the polls up to the, the 1992 election, but then lost. Uh, and the Conservatives returned with a very small majority, a majority of little over um, 20, uh, which eventually by 1997 would have disappeared as well. Um, and But the Sun basically, you know, still aggressively um, anti-Labour into this time as well. And actually claimed after the day after that, that um, the Sun won the election for um, the Conservative Party. This really uh, position of the Sun and other tabloid newspapers was not reflected um, in the diversity of Britain. So if you look at the number of people who voted for the Conservatives and the share of votes for the Conservatives, it's always around 40%. This was not reflected in the newspapers. In 1992, 70% of newspapers supported the Conservative Party, but only 40% of the people in the country supported the Conservative Party. Um, so the electoral, the electoral impact could be questioned, but no prime ministers, literally no prime minister has won an election without, since 79 without the support of particular of the Sun. Other features of news in the 1980s and onwards, patriotic nationalism. Um, so here we have a classic newspaper, a classic Sun headline from uh, the Falklands War in 1982. Uh, our lads sink gunboat and whole cruiser. Um, and there you go, union boycotts war underneath it as well. You've got to get some digs in at trade unions as well, you know. Uh, Anti-football fans and very much anti the city of Liverpool. Um, the 
most disgusting and most vile um, newspaper front page of all time, as far as I'm concerned, is this one on the screen right now. The Truth, published a couple of days after the um, Hillsborough disaster in 1989. Um, this newspaper front page it undoubtedly transformed the discourse around the Hillsborough disaster, criminalised in the eyes of many people who died on that day and um, led, you know, it, it took the best part of 25 years for campaigners to reverse the kind of damage that this front page did with regards to the reputation of people who were crushed to death that day and their only, the only thing that they did was went to go and watch a football match. The Hillsborough disaster eventually um, the blame for the tragic events of that day would correctly be ascribed to South Yorkshire Police and Sheffield Wednesday Football Club and their multiple um, negligent behaviours in terms of the quality of the stadium and the policing on that day. But this newspaper headline crim basically created a discourse that said that the people who were killed that day and the people who were crushed that day and the people who witnessed one of some of the worst scenes you can imagine were effectively criminals. Just to give some background to what this, what this article came from, this article um, was leaked by a police officer to a Conservative MP called Irvin Patnick, who was uh, an MP for one of the Sheffield constituencies, who then leaked this information to The Sun. Uh, the editor at The Sun at the time was Calvin McKenzie. Calvin McKenzie um, frequently refused to uh, apologise for these um, comments that he was made, that, you know, his newspaper, his front page, frequently refused to do so, eventually would give a half-hearted and mealy-mouthed uh, apology some 25 years later, but I think it's a bit late at that point. Basically, this, what does this tell us about the sun in the 1980s? Anti-football fans, anti-city of Liverpool. Why would it hate Liverpool, Leighton? Well, Liverpool, very much a socialist city, a labour sporting city. Um, very pro law and order, no criticism of the police, no criticism of authority in that sense, uh, and no willingness to actually investigate and a, a total willingness to lie about the events of that day. You also get hand in hand with this kind of vile sort of um, coverage, you also get completely sort of irrelevant nonsense, uh, you know, Freddie Starr ate my hamster. Really? You know, I know you guys don't actually know who Freddie Starr is. He was one of these desperately unfunny comedians from the 1970s. But this is front page news. What? What? So, you get a change basically in journalism, right? Uh, those are quite reflective of some of the changes. There are wider changes in the journalistic profession as well. So with rise in production costs, easier to, and cheaper to use gossip, entertainment, celebrity news. Rather than serious journalism uh, around politics, foreign coverage and investigative and specialist journalism, these are all sort of constrained and constricted at this time in favour of lightweight news. What we would now call clickbait. And indeed, looking at newspapers in the contemporary setting, you know, this actual change in journalistic values has become pretty much endemic. Um, at the same time, changes in production would emerge during the 1980s as well. So the whopping dispute is very, very important in the context of this. Newspapers, even up to the 1980s, were still compressed, uh, composed using hot metal, labour-intensive linotype methods, not an electronic method at all. Very labour-intensive, very much meant that you had to have a large workforce to do this. When there was alternative technologies which had been available for some time now, digital technologies and digital printing had been available for a long, long time, could be much cheaper, much more efficient. Basically, in the 1980s, the labour practices of the newspaper industry are going to meet with the IT revolution and you're going to see a change in practice. So, in 1986, 6,000 News International, News International is the company owned by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, workers went on strike because News International planned new working conditions, flexible working, no strike clause, um, 
end of close uh, shop and new uh, IT methods in the production. So when these news, well, when these um, striking workers went on strike, News International sacked all the strikers and moved its production basically to a plant that they've already built. Um, this is kind of how devious and cunning that News International, owned by Rupert Murdoch, is. So they built a new print works in secret. Uh, with all this digital technology in it. Then they tried to impose a new contract in workers, knowing that the workers would go out and strike. And as soon as they went out and strike, they sacked all the workers and moved all their production to Wapping to this new site. Kind of uh, evil genius, brilliant, but it, it stinks as well, right? So this became known as Fortress Wapping. Um, basically, you get a lot of production going on at this site, heavily fortified. Basically, it's a bit like a prison or something like that. High walls around it, barbed wire, armed guards around the place. Huge amount of mass demonstrations and picketing outside the, the, outside the plant as this industrial dispute was going on. But um, this became like a flashpoint for post minor strike um, conflict between unions and employers. Uh, police were deployed in large numbers, many confrontations. Of course, News International had the support of the Conservative government. It had police backing, full, and basically production was not affected during this time at all. And of course, they had newspapers as well to demonise the strikers at the same time as well. So we get more, you know, basically, what does this tell us? Well, the newspaper industry by 1986 had resolved the issues it had with organised labour and trade unions by sacking them all. Uh, and moving to new facilities and embracing digital technology. So um, that embracing of digital technologies then floods throughout the industry. You get a change in journalistic practices into a digital era. You also get a change in working conditions and from being a safe, well-paid uh, industry to work in, the newspaper industry undergoes radical change in the 1980s to the extent to now that journalists are effectively freelancers uh, and to have a staff job as a journalist in a newspaper is so rare in this day and age most journalists are actually just freelancers by 1988, nearly all newspapers had left Fleet Street for example so everything is being consolidated in new places with new technology and concurrently you get massive job losses um, you cut production costs by losing jobs thousands of jobs start to disappear from the industry um, and that continues to this day um, the industry now employs virtually nobody compared to its heyday um, and that really can be traced back to the changes in the industry in the 1980s The newspaper industry, my friends, is in effect in terminal decline. These are newspaper readership uh, numbers over time. I mean, it, it, it just incredible numbers here. If you look at uh, the, the unbroken blue line, which sort of reaches a peak um, in 1965 over 5 million, that's the Daily Mirror. Daily Mirror goes from four, five million sales 50 years ago to just over a million in 2015. And it's a lot less than that now. Um, the Sun, 4 million odd going into the 90s, is now down to 2 million. It's a hell of a lot less than that now. Um, and it's just yeah, a huge you know, um, fall in numbers over time. In 2015, this sort of as a daily circulation, you're still getting about 6 million newspapers sold in the UK. In 2020, you can halve that. And in fact, you can go under half that as well. So the newspaper industry, from being so critically important throughout the 20th century for inventing a new business model, for inventing like the business model which social media has today of creating an audience to be sold to advertisers, from having massive political influence, both at the start of and later on in the century. As we sit in 2020, the newspaper industry is in absolute terminal decline. And um, in five years time, if I'm doing this lecture then, well, two things. One, what have I done with my life? And two, I suspect that graph will be replaced with just a list of newspapers that have closed over the interim period. Okay, that's all I've got to say about newspapers from the 20th century. Um, if you have any questions, hit me up on the comment section uh, in, on this uh, YouTube page or email me. Um, and I'll be back sometime later with the next uh, lecture in the course.
which will be the history of television. Cheers, guys.